Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Kent. I am Reverend Stephen, your minister. It is good to be together again. Thank you for joining us this morning as we gather once again in person and on Zoom, a spiritual community seeking to be diverse and inclusive as we inspire love, work for justice, and grow together in community. For those here in person, there will be plenty to do this morning. We'll have a social justice conversation downstairs about environmental concerns. We'll be decking the halls and there will be coffee and I understand cake in Hobbs Hall. Yeah, <laughs> cake, yes. <laughs> right. Once again, welcome. <laughs> Now, to center ourselves, let's take a moment to just take a deep breath. Thanksgiving weekend, feel gratitude for one another, for this community, and for everything we have in life. And let's invite the Spirit to be present among us and open our hearts to life and the gift of this day as we reflect on change. Come, let us worship together. Well, Kevin and David Bowie are a hard act to follow. I have something to confess. I'm not a huge fan of change. Not the song, but just change in general. It fits right in with several other of my personality characteristics that include a pretty significant lack of spontaneity and a dislike of surprises or being blindsided. That said, I think I've dealt pretty well with changes in my life that are the norm for most people I know. Relationships, moves of residents, children, although autism was a pretty big curveball, jobs, losses of family or friends. I was feeling comfortable talking about change today with a certain degree of well, smugness. I got this, I thought. That was until last Tuesday. I had a six month follow up doctor's appointment before work at 8 a.m. It's no big deal. It was routine right up until the end when my internist of 32 years quietly told me she's retiring in January. 30 two years. Just over half of my life with one practitioner who was just out of her residency when we met and whom I have followed to three offices in three decades. I simply stared at her over my mask, stunned, silent. And then if you know me, you know the tears came and I had a very soggy mask. She and I have been through a lot over the years, especially the ongoing treatment of my chronic depressive disorder. She's been rock steady and always there for me whenever I needed her. We were partners. Wow. Now what? How am I going to navigate this change? I wasn't prepared. I'm not ready for this and I don't want it to happen. Truth is, change is going to happen whether or not I'm ready, prepared, or want it. At the moment, I'm still grieving. It's a major upheaval in my aging years, and I'm not looking forward to breaking in a new to me physician. And break them in, I must. But I will do what I have to do with this unwelcome change. Dry my tears, accept the reality, conduct research, engage in discussion with trusted friends, make a choice, and pray for the best, knowing always that other life changes await me. As Unitarian Universalists, 
We light a flame within a chalice to unite us in worship, to remind us of our ongoing search for the light of truth within us and among us, a light to guide us on our shared journey, and a reminder that we are all interconnected in the great web of existence of which we are each a beloved part. As Katie lights our shared chalice, I invite you to light your home chalice. And please join in our words of covenant by James Villa Blake. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. I'd love to have the young and the young at heart come up and join me. Hi. This morning is change, right? So let's talk about the creature of habit, shall we? What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. So, on the island of habit, there lived a creature. He had very big teeth, and very big eyes, and very, very big feet. Do you suppose he had big hands, too? Probably. Probably had a big appetite, too. Every day, the creature did the exact same things in the exact same order. First, he ate three pineapples and two bananas. Then he walked down to the water to say hello to the fish. Can we all say, hello fish? Hello fish. After that, he went looking for shells, but he kept only the very best shells, the most beautiful ones. Then he said hello to the trees, so hello trees, and the rocks, hello rocks, and the crab who lived under the rocks, hello crab. And then it was time for dinner, and he ate three more pineapples, and two more bananas. Then he brushed his teeth and went to bed. Every day was exactly the same, which was just how the creature liked it. But then one morning, he spotted a boat. It was a very small boat, and it was carrying a very small creature. That creature had very small teeth, and very small eyes, and very, very small feet. So did the creature have small hands too? Yeah. Yep, and what kind of an appetite did the creature have? Small, small you think? You, you. Okay. Nobody had ever visited the island before, and the very big creature couldn't wait to show his new friend how everything worked. He taught him how to collect pineapples and bananas and say hello to the fish. Hello, hello fish. He showed him how to find the very best shells and when to eat his dinner and brush his teeth and go to bed. The next morning, the very big creature woke up excited to do it all over again, just like he did every day. But that very small creature, where'd he go? He was nowhere to be found. When he finally appeared, the small creature was excited to start the day too only instead of eating three pineapples and two bananas, he ate a single coconut. I know. It's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> instead of saying hello to the fish, the little creature went for a swim with them. It's shocking. <laughs> and instead of collecting shells, well, the little creature collected everything else. When it got dark, the very small creature didn't eat dinner or brush his teeth or go to bed. He just sat on the beach and looked at the stars. 
Watching him, the very big creature's very big eyes began to twitch. This wasn't how things were done on the island of habits. There was supposed to be a schedule, a routine, an order to things. Otherwise, anything. For the very next week, the very big creature kept an eye on the very small creature. Some days, the very small creature made sandcastles after breakfast, and some days, he stood on his head before dinner. Some days, he slept in, and some days, he stayed up late. Some days, he did nothing at all. It was absolute madness! Then one morning, as the very big creature was eating his breakfast, which was three pineapples and two bananas, they're good, <laughs> the very small creature gave him an orange. And the very big creature looked at it carefully. It was smaller than a pineapple and rounder than a banana. It was something he'd never tried before. And you know what? It was pretty good, but not as good as pineapple. Afterward, he noticed the very small creature saying hello to the clouds. Hello, hello clouds. The very big creature had said hello to a lot of things. The trees. Hello, the trees. The rocks. Hello, the, rocks. the crab who lived under the rocks. Hello, the crab. <laughs> but never the clouds. Hello, clouds. Yeah. <laughs> he thought about giving it a try, but he didn't want to miss his appointment with the fish. <laughs> Later, the very small creature found some treasures on the beach. And even though he was supposed to be looking for shells, the very big creature was secretly happy when he found a treasure too. Well, that day was fun and it was almost over. It was time to eat dinner and brush their teeth and go to bed. But the very small creature had other plans. The very big creature watched him go thinking about all the unusual things that had happened that day the orange, and the clouds, and the treasures on the beach. Hello, treasures. <laughs> the very big creature sat down. Then he stood up again, his very big heart beating very, very fast. And he decided he was going to follow the little creature. Well, the very big creature had never been out at this hour before. Everything looked different. The sky was full of color, and the sun, as round as an orange, was disappearing into the water. He knew this wasn't where he was supposed to be right now. But as the world turned from pink to orange to purple all around him, he wondered if maybe it actually was where he was supposed to be. Do you think so? Yeah. Yeah. So later, they would eat dinner and brush their teeth and go to bed. And tomorrow, there would be time to stick to the schedule if they wanted to. After all, anything could happen. But for now, the sky was beginning to perform yet another magic trick. What was that trick? The stars, yep. So together, they sat and watched it change. And they said to the stars, Hello, stars. Hello, stars. <laughs> Yeah. And they lived happily ever after, doing different things every day. <laughs> again, yeah, they lived happily ever after again. So, I wonder, what do you do when things come along to make life different, when changes happen? You ignore it. <laughs> Joe? You just got to go along with it and see what happens? Go with the flow. Yeah. Eat a whole bunch of food. Yeah, like on Thanksgiving? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But do you eat a whole lot of food every day? No? <laughs> All right. Thank you for, for coming up and, and helping me tell our story. So now it's time to sing together. We'll sing the first verse, and then on the second verse, our children, our care providers and our teachers are welcome to go to your classes. We are a community that seeks to care for each other, so we take time to share our lives. This morning, some of you come to worship with sorrows, struggles, and losses that you're carrying. 
Let's take time to share those now. If you're on Zoom and have a sorrow, loss, or struggle to share, please use the chat box. We hold in our hearts all the youth struggling with depression. We hold in our hearts and grieve the victims of violence this week, including the seven people killed at the Walmart in Chesapeake, Virginia, the five who were killed in Colorado Springs a week ago, the four students who were killed in Moscow, Idaho. We pray for their families and friends as they grieve these losses, and we pray for an end to violence and the loss of innocent lives. There's anyone you're thinking of this morning who is sick or struggling, you're welcome to mention their name out loud now. Let's enter now into a spirit of prayer with these words adapted from Reverend Sarah Lawal. Spirit of life and love, may we hear the cries of the world. May we be vessels of comfort and compassion. May we be vessels of hope and healing for those we've named this morning, those we hold in our hearts and minds, those in the world in need of our care and compassion. May we hear the voice within calling us to ask what's possible, to walk to the edge, to take a leap of faith into possibility and fullness of life and dance with the infinite for a while. May we hear each other's voices of love and encouragement and may we dare to offer that love and encouragement in return, helping each other become our most loving and fullest selves. And may love prevail. There have been moments of joy, wonder, and awe this week, moments that have lifted our spirits. Once again, on Zoom, you're welcome to use the chat box to share your joys with us. And we have these as well. Wendy and Todd share that Coleman turned 15 this past week. Wow, happy day to Coleman. Heidi and Randy share the wonderful news that their grandson, Andrew Carey Schaefer, was born on the 22nd to Connor and Holly. Congratulations. And this is grandchild number two. Yeah. Now with gratitude for these and every blessing we receive in life, for the gift of life itself, for the companionship of one another on life's journey, for the beauty of our world, and for this day of possibility, let us raise our hearts in gladness and together say, Amen.
Our first reading is an excerpt from Earth Seed by Octavia Butler. We are born not with purpose, but with potential. All that you touch, you change. And all that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. For our second reading, an excerpt from The Way of Transition by William Bridges. It's a paradox. To achieve continuity, we have to be willing to change. Change is, in fact, the only way to protect whatever exists. For without continuous readjustment, the present cannot continue. A marriage, a career, a dream for the future, even a picture of the past. Each of these things is being primed for destruction if it does not change over time. Here is another paradox. The very things that we now wish we could hold on to and keep safe from change were themselves originally produced by changes. And many of these changes in their day look just as daunting as any in the present do. No matter how solid and comfortable and necessary the status quo feels today, it was once new, untried, and uncomfortable. Our third reading from Sonnets to Orpheus, Part 2, 12, by Ranier Maria Rilke. Want the change. Be inspired by the flame where everything shines as it disappears. The artist, when sketching, loves nothing so much as the curve of the body as it turns away. What locks itself into sameness has congealed. Is it safer to be gray and numb? What turns hard becomes rigid and is easily shattered. Pour yourself out like a fountain. Flow into the knowledge that what you are seeking finishes often at the start and with ending begins. Every happiness is the child of a separation it did not think it could survive. And Daphne, becoming a laurel, dares you to become the wind. There is a small, ancient monastery in Greece at the top of a mountain. It's known as a pilgrimage site because there's a beautiful icon to visit. But the only way to that monastery is to be pulled up the mountainside in a basket with a rope. A pilgrim has come on, tour on tourism, comes to visit the monastery, is pulled up and arrives, and then takes a look at the rope to notice it's frayed around the edges and it's looking kind of ragged. And the tourist, the pilgrim, looks at the monk and says, asks, how do you know when it's time to change the rope? And the monk just sort of looks at him for a moment and says rather gruffly, when it breaks. Some changes are like that, a rope that breaks. So I want to take you back two and a half years. Do you remember our first Sunday on Zoom? We made a sudden shift to virtual services as the pandemic got worse. Perhaps a sign of things to come, we made that decision on Friday the 13th. Our first virtual service was on Sunday, March 15th, 2020. In two days, we managed to take the first steps of what would become a major change for how we do church. Initially, for me, it was exciting and fun, new technology. 
It was a huge change, which no one really even had time to consider. But I think it was softened by some feelings of hope. The pandemic would be short-lived and we'd soon be back to normal. Remember that hope? Did you have it? Just a few weeks, right? <laughs> Thank you. Ha! Huh. It didn't turn out that way. And now we refer to liminal time, which is a nice way of saying things are going to keep changing and we have no clue what comes next. What we can safely assume is that things will keep changing, perhaps too quickly. And as Mrs. Astor said on the Titanic, I rang for ice, but this is absurd. The Soul Matters theme for this month is the path of change. At the risk of stating the obvious, change is a reality of life. As Octavia Butler so aptly says, the only lasting truth is change. It's a necessary part of life. Without it, our lives would be static and boring. There would be no growth, no vitality. But change is stressful, even change we consider good and choose for ourselves. Okay, I want to know, how many of you bounded out of bed this morning saying to yourself, gee, my life is too static and boring. I think I'll make a few changes just for the fun of it. How about a show of hands here? I thought so. Change means unknowns and uncertainty. A new career or the dream job you've been wanting for years comes with new demands, new expectations, and a big learning curve. You have to move for that job. There is the added stress of adjusting to living in a new place, finding your way around, and creating a life for yourself once again. The end of a relationship or the death of a partner or a spouse or even needing to find a new internist creates a huge hole in the fabric of our lives. We've come to depend on that person, and we don't even realize how much we depended on them until we're gone. I recently read an article about change, and I have an un additional understanding of why change is hard. I'd never thought about this before, but along with the uncertainty, change means loss. Even when it's due to the best of circumstances, it requires us to lose something, whether it's a routine, a relationship, familiarity, a place that holds memories, convenience, a reputation, something that's known. Change also requires us to face the reality that we're not really in control. That spiritual rope breaks with a major illness or other health crisis. It might require significant changes in our lifestyle, even temporarily, more active, less physically active, dietary changes, medications we have to take the rest of our lives. As we're adjusting to a change, there's often a lot of discomfort and unknowns. My former spiritual director offering me guidance in a time in my life and a lot of changes referred to it as having both feet firmly planted in midair. So how are you feeling? I'm tired of having to constantly adjust. I want it to just stop for a little while. There hasn't been time to process all the changes or settle into a new familiar rhythm that's dependable. Is that true for you as well? Yeah. But change doesn't stop occurring just because we want or need it to stop or slow down. Then we have to figure out how to cope with it. What about your spiritual life? Do you have regular spiritual practices that give you strength, peace, and hope? as changes continue to happen to us as individuals, a community, and a world. I've managed all the changes that have happened pretty well for the most part because I have an active spiritual life that helps keep me centered and grounded. I spend time in nature regularly. It reminds me of a truth that in the midst of constant change, there are things that are timeless, and I find reassurance in those. The seasons change, but the cycle of life goes on. Summer turns to fall, and I know that winter will follow, and then spring, and once again summer. I can trust that and hold on to it. And nature also teaches that change can be beautiful. The first flowers of spring, 
the sunset and the sunrise, the fall foliage, the first snowfall. And as the saying goes, without change, the world would have no butterflies. Yes, and still, changes are incredibly hard and painful and frightening. Let's not downplay or dismiss this reality. We're Unitarian Universalists. Our faith affirms that change is part of our lifelong spiritual path. Our fourth principle affirms a lifelong search for truth and meaning, new truths, new insights into being human, new ways of understanding the sacred, what we each hold to be ultimate and worthy of our reverence. New ways are always waiting to be discovered. Our denomination has been changing and continues to do so. If you haven't heard already, Article 2 of the UUA bylaws, the section that includes the principles and sources, is being reviewed and a radical change is proposed. How many of us grew up in this faith knowing the principles and the sources? It's all we've, some of us have ever known. We'll learn about these changes before long and discuss it together. There's a lot more that could be said about change, including the fact that as a congregation, you've had a lot of changes and loss in the past few years. It's been hard. But instead of saying a lot more about change, I thought we'd take time together and do a ritual to acknowledge change and the loss and grief that come with it, to hold each other in care and in silence, and to give and receive the gifts of community and healing. In these uncertain times when so much is unknown, what we can trust is that we have each other, and somehow together we'll get there. We'll find our way through. This ritual has been adapted from the work of Edward Searle. We've all experienced changes in our lives, from lesser things like a favorite restaurant or store closing or a much-loved shirt wearing out, to the bigger and sometimes frightening things, a journey through a disease, everything that has changed because of COVID, and good changes too, a new job or home, a relationship or friendship that has blossomed, a new passion or interest that brings us joy. Let's take some silence together to reflect on changes in our lives, both large and small. I invite Randy to come light a candle for all the changes we've experienced. Change brings loss with it. Sometimes the loss is major and hard. The death of a loved one, whether human or animal. A job loss or retirement. The end of a friendship or relationship or marriage. Even when change is due to the best of circumstances, such as marriage, graduating from school, or getting a new car, it requires us to lose something. A routine, familiarity, memories, comfort, or convenience. In the silence, Let's reflect on losses in our lives. Rod, would you come light a candle for losses we've all experienced? The world expects us to keep our emotions to ourselves, to get over it and move on. 
But part of our spiritual work of healing is to work through grief and know that it never truly ends. It is healthy to grieve loss and change. Grief and loss are normal human feelings, but they can become toxic if they are not worked through and released. In the silence, let's think about what we need to grieve and give ourselves permission to feel grief. Elaine, would you light a candle? For grief. Thank you. As we face change and grief, loss in our lives, we have the gift of this community, people who accept us as we are and invite us to discover our gifts and our passions, those who teach us and challenge us and help us be our best selves, people who are faithful companions on life's mysterious journey, who offer support and care in both the good times and the struggles. Let's take some silence to feel gratitude for this community and the gift of one another. Heidi, would you come light a candle to signify community and to remind us that we are not alone? Thank you. Through expressing our grief and sharing our struggles and losses, there is always the promise of healing, of becoming more whole, of returning to ourselves and our natural state of well-being in which our bodies, minds, and spirits are aligned and at peace. Healing actually comes when we change our attitudes or behaviors in a way that promotes health and wholeness. In the silence, let us reflect on the gift of healing and what that might mean for each of us. Kathy, would you come light the last candle for healing, for the promise of wholeness? Thank you. May it be so. Community is possible because each of us share our gifts, our energy, our financial resources, giving and receiving. Thank you for your generosity and ways that you help us thrive caring for one another. We help others in our community thrive as well by giving to agencies and organizations in Kent and beyond that serve those in need. Our special offering for November has been for Kent Social Services, our local nonprofit dedicated to serving the needs of low-income people in the Kent area. Now in the spirit of gratitude for the gift of one another and this community and the abundance that makes generosity possible, we give and receive the offering as a sign of our shared commitment to the life and work of this congregation and beyond. Would the ushers please come forward? <clears throat> Music. You're all invited to participate. Some people have brought their own drums. We have djembes, we have a cajon, which is a box drum. We've got someone on a wash tub. And I've placed some other percussive instruments around. If you see something in your 
hymnal rack, you're welcome to pick it up and shake it or tap on your pew. Those at home, find something to tap or, or beat on. So the purpose of this is to demonstrate how we help each other through unexpected changes. So I'm gonna lead a beat, but that beat might change in the middle. So just try to keep up. You don't have to do exactly what I'm doing. Do your own individual thing, but try to stay with the beat. So there are also some chimes out there. If you see a chime in your, on your pew or in your little hymnal rack, can I see anybody? Hold up chime if you have one. Okay, good. I think they're all accounted for. So the chimes is a little different. This side over here can start out with the first beat, but when you hear the beat change, please stop playing and then you guys play. And if you hear the beat change in a little while, stop and let it go back and there will be two different sounds coming out, two different keys, and it'll be really fun. So just follow my beat and um, it, might, it might change up. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's time to bring our reflection on change, our worship to its end. Would you join me in the words for extinguishing the chalice? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. We carry these in our hearts and minds until we are together again. Just a reminder that next Sunday we will be in Hobbs Hall at 11 a.m. for our community Sunday. Please join us. And once again, you're welcome to stay after this service and help deck the halls for the season or attend the social justice discussion downstairs in Fessenden Hall. And it is today. <laughs> right, Andrew? That's right. Yeah, thank you. Andrew will lead, I believe. Yes. Sure. Great. Yep. Uh, or coffee and cake over in uh, Hobbs Hall. Wow, is that possible? It is. Thank you, Elaine. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> These are the words of John O'Donohue. May our minds come alive together to the invisible geography that invites us to new frontiers, to break the dead shell of yesterdays, to risk being disturbed and changed. May we have the courage today to live the life that we would love, to postpone our dreams no longer, but to do at last what we came here for and waste our hearts on fear no more. Now trusting that as we experience change and loss and new opportunities in life, we have one another and our faith to guide us on the way, let us go forth in peace and in hope to continue inspiring love, seeking justice, and growing together in community. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. And I see the light in you.